Hello and welcome to Empowered Learning. This video will be about defining what local extrema um, actually is and what this means um, in a first year calculus course. Uh, we will also talk about the concept of a critical value, uh, an important theorem called Fermat's theorem, and an important procedure that actually also comes from a theorem called the closed interval method. So the main point of this particular video here will to be will be to describe what we mean when we say uh, what is a local maximum or some people may call it a relative maximum um, what is a local minimum um, also known as a relative minimum um, as well as what a global max and a global min are and some people call those absolute max or absolute min um, you will see me interchanging um, the, the names, meaning um, I may use local max sometimes, I may use relative max sometimes. Um, sometimes uh, in talking about the, the global, I may use like global min or, or absolute min. Okay? Um, all those mean the same thing. It just really depends upon um, what resource or reference you're looking at. But essentially those things mean the same thing. And we're going to talk about what that actually means. So um, in terms of a critical value, um, all that is is just an, a particular x value for a function to where it lets us know we either have a local max or a local min. And uh, we'll see the particulars on what that actually is. Uh, Fermat's theorem uh, will be a theorem that basically piggybacks off of the critical um, value definition to let us know um, when we essentially have a condition where our function is forced to have horizontal tangent lines, okay? Um, and then the critical, uh, sorry, not critical, but the uh, closed interval method will be a procedure that's tied to uh, the concept of a um, absolute max and absolute min uh, to give us conditions with a function to where we're guaranteed to have both a global max and a global min. And so that's what the um, extreme value theorem is about, uh, which we won't necessarily talk about in this video, uh, but uh, in terms of the, the critical, sorry, the, the closed interval method, um, we are going to talk about that. And I'm going to mention something briefly about the extreme value theorem uh, to try to tie in all that. Okay. So uh, the first thing that I want to do is to bring back to your remembrance a few things that you've probably learned at this point, um, especially if you're watching the, the series of videos for a first year calculus course that I'm making, um, or if you're reviewing this, um, what I'm about to mention should be something that you remember. Um, if you don't, then uh, you may want to go back and review some of these concepts. And of course, um, I have videos uh, that you can watch to be able to do that. So the first thing I want to do is um, recall situations um, after you learn how to take derivatives really fast. Um, that is to say, you learn some basic differentiation rules. Um, you probably had some problems um, shortly afterwards that would say, hey, I give you some function f of x. Uh, what you need to do is find the derivative of that function set it equal to zero and find out what are the corresponding values of x for that, okay? Now, uh, one of the things that you should have uh, learned from solving problems like that is that anywhere where we have the derivative of some function that equals zero, that means that the slope of the tangent line is equal to zero. And we know that um, constant functions have a slope of the tangent line is equal to zero because constant functions are lines with a slope of zero. And we also know uh, functions at places where it has uh, what I would like to call a smooth peak or a smooth dip also has that trait. And so uh, what I mean by that here is if I make, so here, notice that this particular uh, peak, um, if this is part of a function, the peak of it has a horizontal tangent line right at the top of it. And down here for this dip, we have a horizontal tangent line right at the bottom. Okay. 
So uh, these sort of things we should have remembered. Now, the, the main thing that we're going to be doing in this video to start off with, um, we already know that what we're looking at here, uh, this particular point, is what we're going to call a local max. Okay, And this point here is what's going to be called a local min or local minimum. Okay, um, Also called a relative max and or relative min, uh, respectively. So conceptually, we already know uh, that a local or relative max is just a place on the graph of a smooth and continuous function where we have, uh, well, really not smooth and continuous, but um, it's a place on a graph where, um, where we have a peak and a local or relative min is somewhere on a graph where we have a dip. Okay. Now, one of the things that we're going to see a little bit later on is there is a slight difference in between having what's called a smooth peak versus a peak that looks like this. Okay. And so uh, the main thing that we'll see here is that at this particular point, we can take the derivative of this function that I've drawn here at this point. Whereas I cannot take the derivative of a function I've drawn here at this point, because one of the things that we should know um, at, at this point in the study of a first year calculus course is that we're not able to take the derivative of a function at corners. OK, uh, we can't take them at corners. We can't take them at cusp. We can't take them at the end of the domain. We can't take it um, at a jump discontinuity. Uh, we can't take it at a vertical asymptote. OK. All right. So um, we're going to talk about all those things, but what we're going to do is essentially formalize what we mean when we say we have um, a maximum or a minimum at a particular x value for a function. OK, um, after we do that, then when we get into talking about critical value, uh, what we will do is say, hey, I'm acting as if I don't know what the graph of this function looks like. So I don't know where it's possible um, peaks and dips may be. So what I want to do is um, computationally find out where my peaks and dips are. And that's really the, the whole point of the critical um, value and its definition. OK, um, from Oz theorem again is going to piggyback off of that. And uh, we're going to learn something about the, the closed interval method as well. Um, if we are going to be looking at some function, uh, continuous function within a closed interval, and uh, we wanted to figure out uh, what's going to be the what we call absolute max and absolute min values. And we have some conditions um, that would have to be met in order to have a max and uh, absolute max and absolute min value guaranteed. OK. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and get into the actual uh, definitions of what a local slash relative max and min are, as well as a global uh, max slash um, absolute max and min are, uh, so that we can get those pinned down and then uh, do some examples and, and, and just kind of move along. All right, so the first thing that we'll do is go over what we mean when we say we have a global max or global min, um, also known as absolute max or absolute min values. OK, um, in short, if we consider a function and I'm going to call it F over a closed interval um, from A to B, uh, where X is in the domain of that function F, then we could identify uh, what we would call the highest Y value and the lowest y value um, as well as uh, what value c that's going to be inside of that closed interval from a to b um, these events occur at, okay so simply speaking here if i'm looking within a closed interval here uh, the x value that corresponds to the highest y value will be the absolute max the x value that corresponds to the lowest y value would, would be the absolute min. And um, what I mean by this statement here, where we could also consider some value c that's within this closed interval for a to b, we could have some situations within that closed interval um, where, let's say, if we have a, a global max at x equals b, 
we also may have the same global max value at x equals c, which is inside or in between these two values, a and b. Okay, so we're looking at all those cases. All right, so formally, let's go over these definitions quickly here. Um, for a global max, um, we see that um, if we let f be some function and d be the domain on that function, and let C be some uh, real number such that that value C is also in the domain of the function, then uh, we say that our function has at least one global maximum value um, at this X value C if the Y value at X equals C is larger than or equal to the um, Y value for any X value that's in the total domain for it. Okay. So that's a fancy way to say uh, if you're considering all the X values that map to Y values for your function, um, you're going to have a, a, a global maximum um, at the X value that corresponds to the highest Y value. Okay, that's, that's why I'd said it that way. Um, of course, your global minimum, also known as relative minimum, is just the same thing, but instead of it being the um, x value that corresponds to the highest y value is just going to be the x value corresponding to the lowest y value. And the way that we formally state that is that um, we know that f is going to have at least one global minimum at some x value c if the y value that corresponds to this x value c is going to be lower than or equal to um, all the other y values um, in the domain of this function. Okay. So again, giving you the formal definition, but simply put, if you think of, if I look within the, the domain of some function and I pick what's the highest Y value, if I can actually pick that, then that's going to be the global max. Um, if I can pick uh, the X value that corresponds to the lowest Y value, then that's going to be the global min. Okay. Um, the global min value will be the, the actual Y value. And the location of where the global min happens is going to be the X value. Okay. So um, don't want to overcomplicate it. That's pretty much it when it comes to that. Now, when we talk about local max and local min, um, of course, I'll write this here also called relative max or relative min. Remember that what we're talking about are essentially peaks and dips in our graph, okay? And these peaks and dips could look like this, or they could look like this, or they could look like this, okay? Now, the main thing to understand here is that when we talk about a, a local max or local min, what we are talking about is a localized um, place in in the graph of our function where we see um, our graph essentially say, hey, if we look in between this really small, narrow uh, interval of X values, we're going to see that uh, there is some particular value that's going to be the highest one amongst um, all those Y values within this small localized area. Okay. And so that's the big difference in between a, a global max versus a local max. Global says I'm looking at everything, okay? Um, you, you give me um, an interval of X values to look over and I'm looking over all of them. I'm looking at the corresponding Y values compared, uh, corresponding to all those X values. For a local, for a local max, I'm saying, hey, I'm just looking at a very small, a narrow uh, localized area or a very small interval of X values. Now, uh, the reason why I'm stating it that way is because when we read the definition of what a local max or local min uh, would be, the definition doesn't lend itself to tell you that, hey, we're just talking about a small localized area. Okay. Um, you don't get that from the definition at first glance when you read it. Um, you have to kind of know the background and intent of the definition first be before you read it. And so that's part of the reason why I'm here to try to communicate that to you. Okay. 
Um, in short, if you just keep in mind that, hey, uh, local max is where your peaks are, local min is where your dips are, you should be good to go. Um, but again, just for uh, rigor's sake, I want to make sure that you know what these formal definitions actually look like. Okay. And so I'm going to get to uh, the first definition here, which is a local maximum. And it says, if we have some function f that is a local maximum at some real number value c, and that's, um, of course, value c is going to be in between um, some other interval um, a and b, then we know that the following two conditions are satisfied. Okay, So I'm taking the approach of this definition of saying, hey, if you have a local max, this is what you're going to see. First, there's going to exist at least one open interval, um, A to B. And remember how before when we were talking about the global, we had the closed interval, but for the local maximum, we have an open interval, okay? And that's done on purpose uh, because we wanna consider everything that's on the inside and not necessarily at the end values of that interval, okay? And uh, there, there are reasons for that that I'm going to explain a little bit later, okay? So we know that there exists at least one open interval such that this value C here that's going to be inside uh, this open interval, um, all that's going to kind of go together, okay? So uh, we know that we have this interval. We know that this value C is going to be inside of it. So that's the, the first thing, okay? The second thing is that we know that for all these values of X that we're considering inside this closed interval, sorry, this um, open interval here, including this value C, we know that the Y values for all of the corresponding X values that are within this open interval here are going to be uh, smaller than or equal to the corresponding Y value for uh, this X value C here, okay? And so um, if that's the case, um, I'll write this another way. Um, if f of c is greater than or equal to f of x, then we know the y value for c in this small localized area is larger than the corresponding y value for any x value within this small um, localized interval. Okay? And so this graph here is just essentially trying to communicate that. Um, you can think of this graph as a graph that's been zoomed in a whole, whole lot. Um, because again, I don't put numbers here. Uh, this could be something like negative um, 0.01 here, and this could be uh, 1.00001, like that, okay? So again, this is a very small, narrow, um, open interval of X values that we're really considering here, okay? All right. So for a local minimum, um, it's the same thing, same flavor of definition. Um, the only thing that's different now is that the F of C here is going to be smaller than or equal to F of X, meaning that the uh, corresponding Y value for X equals C is going to be the lowest value out of all of the Y values here that are being considered within this open interval from A to B. And of course, um, we see again uh, that where we have the dip at, that's pretty much where that happens, okay? All right, so some key points that we need to know. And so these are, are things that I'm extracting out of the definition that aren't explicitly told to you but uh, we need to understand that these things are implied before we move forward, okay? So number one, um, the local, the meaning the word local in local max or local min, or if you wanna use the word relative, uh, the word relative in relative max or relative min means that you are considering the smallest possible interval around some value x equals c to test whether um, you actually have a peak, that is to say a maximum, or a dip, that is to say a minimum in your graph there, okay? Uh, I think I've kind of beat that dead horse, so we'll go ahead and move on. All right, number two, um, a local max or min cannot exist at any location um, on the graph of a function 
where the function is undefined, meaning um, a, a hole, a vertical asymptote, or a break or a gap in the function, even if it looks like um, the graph of that function uh, peaks or dips at that location. Okay. Now I'm going to give you an example of what that looks like. So, um, and I've actually left out one situation here, um, and I'm going to talk about that afterwards as well. But let's say we have a graph of a function here. Here's my value x equals c. And let's say my graph looks like this. Okay. This is y, this is x. Okay. So notice that this particular function here has a hole at x equals c, which means that the graph is undefined at x equals c. Although this graph looks like it's peaking at x equals c, I can't say that this particular graph has a local maximum at x equals c because I do not have a defined point at x equals c. Okay, So that means I actually have to have this point c f of c defined on my graph here for me to be able to say that I actually have a uh, local maximum there. Okay. So again, I have to actually have a defined point at the place that I'm trying to say uh, is a point where I have a local max or a local min. If I have a discontinuity there, um, any type for that matter, um, well, not let me not say discontinuity. If the function is not defined at a particular x value, even if there is a discontinuity there or not, I can't say that I have a local max there or a local min there, okay? Um, I'm going to do another example to uh, show you what I mean by that. All right, so if you've seen here, I've changed this example a little bit. And so um, if you look at this particular graph, notice that um, now I've introduced a uh, discontinuity, a jump discontinuity here. And although this graph looks like, again, it's, it's peaking right here, um, I am not going to be able to say that this graph has a local maximum at x equals c because it's undefined in the place where um, it would be a maximum. Notice here, though, the graph is actually defined at x equals c here, but I can't say that this is going to be a local max because if I make a uh, let's say an interval around here. This x value that comes up here is mapping to um, a y value that's higher than the one at x equals c. So I can't call it a local max. Of course, it's not a local minimum either because if I look here, let's say I choose this x value, I got that point there, which whose y value is going to be lower than that. So I can't say that I have a uh, a, a local minimum at x equals c either, okay? Um, I'm going to do one more example here uh, just to kind of show you a case where um, we would actually consider it to be a uh, local maximum or a local minimum, um, although we have a discontinuity. All right, so in this new graph I've drawn here, um, notice that in, in this case, at x equals c, I actually do have a local maximum uh, because of the fact that at the, at the value x equals c, if I look around this particular value x equals c in a very tight interval, I will see that um, x equals c has a y value that corresponds to the um, highest one amongst all these x values that's in this interval here. Okay. So um, in, in this situation, um, I could actually call this a, uh, a, a local max. So again, the whole point for number two here is that um, notice that x equals c is defined here. So I do have the potential to be able to call it a, um, a local max or local min here. Whereas in the very first example I gave you, um, it was not even defined at x equals c. So there was no way I'm going to, I was going to be able to... Um, say that it was a local max, a local min, okay? Okay, so for my last example here, um, I wanted to talk about this concept of um, dealing with local max and local min 
um, answering those kind of questions when we are talking about the end of a domain here, okay? And so in this case, um, at x equals c, we see that the function ends here. So that means the domain of this function is ending here. And it looks like this, uh, this particular point here is going to be the highest point on the graph of this function here. Okay, we're going to assume that. Now, although it is the highest point on the graph of this function, um, I will not have a local max here at x equals c. So I'll say low, no local max. The reason being is that part of the requirement that I have to have in order to compare to see if something's going to be a local min or local max or not is I have to be able to put a closed, sorry, close, uh, an open interval around x equals c where the values to the left and to the right of um, x equals c actually map to corresponding values of um, my corresponding y values for our function here. Okay. So we know, notice to the left, if I was to do that, yes, I, I'll get to some point over here. But to the right, notice that my function is not defined. And so um, to put this in another way, since my function abruptly stops at x equals c, I technically don't have anything to compare it to to say, hey, uh, is this going to be a local max uh, or a local min or is it just going to be constant there? Um, via the definition of what, what a local max and local min is, and more so um, the definition of a local max and local min um, also inherently piggybacks off of the definition of what increasing, decreasing, and constant actually means um, from pre-cal or college algebra. Um, we know here that because of all that stuff that's implied, um, if I have a function at the end of a domain, um, I'm not going to be able to answer that question of whether it has a local max or local min there. Okay. Now, um, you'll see some textbooks will actually say, yes, you do have a local max or local min at the you know end of a domain if it looks like this. Um, technically, that's incorrect. Um, some textbooks just have just said, hey, we're going to you know take that in this case. But uh, based upon the definition of what um, local max and local min actually means, and um, also taking into the definition of what increasing, decreasing, and constant means, uh, we can't have that. Okay. All right. So for the third topic here, a third key point that we want to know, um, we know that for some point A, B that we're considering to be either a local max or local min, the X value for that point is the location of where the min or max happens. The Y value, which we're calling B here, is actually the local min or max value. So again, the X value for a point that we are considering to be the local max or local min is the location of where that max or min happens. The corresponding Y value is the actual local max or min value. Okay, And that's important to know uh, whenever we get into uh, word problems that deal with us having to maximize or minimize something, um, we need to be able to know, um, is that problem asking us for um, when the min or max happens, or at what time does the min or max happens, or at what position does the min or max happens, or is it just asking us for um, when the min or max, uh, what the min or max actually is, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and, and move forward here and uh, look at some examples. All right, so for this first graph here, uh, you see that we have some function f of x, and um, we're going to ask a series of questions here. Um, I actually have four questions. Uh, you can't see the fourth one because it's down at the bottom of the screen right now, but uh, we'll get to it. So the first question says, at what numbers, if any, does our function f of x have a local maximum? Okay, And um, we're going to translate that when we say at what numbers, what we really just mean is, what are the x values, okay? So um, here, at what x values do we have a, um, a local maximum, okay? 
Now we know local maximum just means, hey, where do we have a peak in our graph? Well, we see we have a, a peak here in our graph. We see we have a peak here in our graph, okay? But we know that this peak at x equals two is the only one that we would need to consider here because here at x equals negative two, our graph is undefined at that particular uh, peak point in our graph. So here at what numbers, meaning the x values, it would only be x equals two, okay? Um, will not be at x equals negative two because again, um, the function is undefined at the place where it looks like it's peaking. Now question two, what are the local maxima? Or in this case, since we only have one location, what is the local maximum? And that's going to be um, at the value nine. So I'm just going to say when y is equal to nine. Okay. So that we see at the point two nine here because one above this is 10. So at this point two nine, um, I know that that point has a local uh, maximum value. The nine is the actual local max value. X equals two is the location where the local max happens. Okay. Now we'll answer the same questions here for uh, the local minimum. Okay. So it says, where does our function have a local minimum at? Okay. So here we see that we have a dip in our graph here, dip in our graph here, dip in our graph here. Now, of course, at this particular dip, since we have a hole, we can't consider that, okay? But we can consider these other two. So here at x equals zero, and this is three, four, five, six, and at x equals six, uh, we do have places where our graph dips. And so that is uh, what we will call uh, formally a local minimum or a relative minimum. So here we'll say at x equals zero and at six, and it says, what are the local uh, minima? Okay. Um, since again, we have two different locations where we experience a local uh, minimum, but of course those values are the same in this case. Um, it's just gonna be y equals zero for both cases, okay? Now, please understand that this does not um, always happen. Um, for instance, if the graph of this function would have came down a little bit lower and came back up, then of course, whatever y value this corresponding point would be at uh, would be the corresponding local minimum for the x value, x equals six. But since they both um, dipped down um, and had a dip on the x-axis, that's why they're both zero here. All right, so let's look at another example. So now we have a graph of uh, some function g of x. And uh, the first thing I want you to notice here that for this function is that um, it does stop on the left at x equals negative eight. And over here, it stops on the right at x equals nine, okay? And so we're gonna answer the same four questions, although these questions are going to be worded a little different, okay? So for question uh, b, um, I here, for what values of X does G of X have a local maximum, okay? So in this case, um, we see that the only two places where our graph peaks is going to be here and here, okay? Now we know uh, because of the discussion I just had, we cannot consider um, places where uh, we are at the end of a domain as potential locations for where we have a local max or local min, even if it looks like, it, okay? Now, again, uh, you may be studying from a textbook that allows this, but in general, um, this is something that is not allowed, okay? Uh, because it violates the definition. And, and I've already talked about that before, so I won't go through it again. All right, over here though, we see that we have the string of points along this particular interval here where all those particular points have the same y value, okay? And we see that this starts at x equals negative three and it ends at x equals zero. So for here, we know that 
uh, to answer this question, we're going to have a local maximum for all values of x in between and including negative 3 and 0. Okay. And so again, uh, the reason why we're able to do that is because, um, I'm going to erase this, every last one of these particular points here, um, if we were to uh, take every x value from x equals 3 to x equals 0 and do like a little small interval around it, we would see that um, every one of those particular locations would meet condition of f of c is greater than or equal to f of x, where x is going to be um, any x value that's in this corresponding small interval around um, any of the x values that I choose from x equals negative 3 to 0. Okay. All right, so it says what are the local uh, maxima, or in this case, what is going to be the local maximum value? And in this case, it's going to be, it's going to be 4. Okay. So every last one of these x values here has a corresponding y value of 4, and that is going to be the maximum value um, around this localized area here. Okay. Now, uh, where are the local minimum? Okay. So here we see that our graph dips here, and our graph dips here. Okay. So uh, we see this happens at x equals negative 6, and this is also happening here at 2, 3, at x equals 4, okay? So here we see at x equals negative 6 and 4, that is where our local uh, minima or our dips in our graph are going to be located. And of course, um, what are going to be the local minima, meaning uh, what are the local uh, minimum values. Of course, for the one uh, corresponding to x equals negative 6, that value is going to be 0, whereas the one that corresponds to x, x equals 4, that value is going to be negative 3. So next, what we are going to do is talk about um, how to look at a particular graph of a function and discern in between uh, local max and local min values, or if you want to call them relative max, relative min values, as well as global maximum and global minimum values. Um, you may want to call those absolute max or absolute min values um, as well, simultaneously. Okay. So, uh, so here we're throwing in questions about um, a global max and global min along with local max and local min so you can see how they're similar but yet how they're different okay so um, I'll go ahead and scroll up here and the first thing that we're going to do is answer questions about um, the local max or local min okay so remember uh, local max means where where are our peaks local min is where are our dips so if we look at our graph here, um, first thing that we see is that, um, and I'm just going to look for the peaks and dips. We have a dip here. We have a peak here. We have a dip here. We do have a peak here, but it's not one that we can consider because the function is not defined there. And we have a dip here, but again, this is at the end of the domain of the function, so we can't consider that. Okay. So we only have three places where we have a potential peak or dip in our graph. Okay? So we see that this first place here is at x equals negative 7. Okay? It's negative 10, negative 9, negative 8, negative 7. The next place would be at negative 6, negative 5, negative 4. So x equals negative 4. And then, of course, the last one here would be at x equals negative 1. Okay. Now, um, this first column here just says location of local max, local min, um, where it occurs. The second column here says what is the actual local min or max value? Um, meaning, 
if I've given you the X values for the corresponding points that I'm looking at, what's the corresponding Y values? Okay. So for this first one here, the corresponding Y value is going to be at three. For the next one, um, it's going to be four, five, six, seven. So the next one's going to be at seven. If I'm reading that correctly here. And at x equals um, negative 1, we'll have a corresponding y value of negative 2. And again, at these points, the x value represents the location of where the minimax happens. The y value is what the minimax value actually is. And of course, um, here we know that at the point negative 7, positive 3, um, that we have a local min. The next one we saw here was a local max. And of course, the last one here was a local min. Okay. All right. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is where are our global max and global min values are. Okay. And I'm going to erase what I have here so that we can um, talk about that before we get to the questions. So remember, when we talk about global max and global min, what we are talking about are the points um, where we end up having the highest Y value and the lowest Y value, okay? Um, if, and sometimes uh, we may have both uh, global max and global min, sometimes we may just have a global max or a global min, and sometimes we may not have um, any of them, okay? In this particular case here, we see that we have a global max at this particular point because this is the highest point on the graph um, in this closed interval from x equals negative 9 to x equals positive 9, and we see that here, this point has the lowest y value in this same interval, okay? So what we're going to say here is that um, at this particular value here, which we saw this was at uh, x equals negative 4. Ooh, that 4 looks horrible. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. Yeah, not much better, but we'll roll with it. All right, so x equals negative four here. Um, we know we have a global max. That global max value is going to be at seven. And of course, um, here at x equals nine, we have a global min value. And the actual global min value here is going to be negative three. And so when we answer um, these questions here, So in this column, we have the global max. It's going to be at x equals negative 4. Corresponding y value was 3. And of course, it's a global max. And the other one was at x equals 9. And that was at y equals negative 3. And that was a global min value. Okay. All right. So um, we're done as of right now talking about the basics of uh, global max and global min. Uh, what I want to do now is kind of move on to uh, talk about uh, various situations that you'll have. Um, in other words, what, what it will look like whenever you have situations of having just a global max or just a global min or having situations where you do not have a global max or global min at all, okay? Now, if we look at figures um, A through D here, notice that figure A is a situation where we have a global max um, value, but we do not have a global min. And of course, we know we don't have a global min because our graph just keeps getting lower and lower and lower on both sides, okay? Similarly, uh, figure B, has a global min value, but not a global max value, okay? 
Now, figures C and D are what we call monotonic functions. Okay. And monotonic means that your function is either always increasing or always decreasing. Okay. And so uh, we know that uh, monotonic functions um, do not have a global max or a globe, uh, neither a global max nor a global min. Okay. Um, the only way that they will have a, a, a global max and or a global min is if you have a monotonic function that is um, within some closed interval. Okay. And so uh, we have a special theorem for that called the extreme value theorem that we'll touch on here um, to address that specific case. Okay. But the main thing I want you to get here is that um, not every function is going to have a global max and or a global min. And there are possibilities where a function could have just a global max or a global min, but not both. All right, so as we have mentioned in figures A through D uh, that we just got through talking about, not all functions have a global max and min and or local min and max values, okay? Um, and let me go back up here and, and mention that as well. So in the case of figure A, um, the global max is also the local max. And in figure B, the uh, global min is also the local min. So we can have, um, a global max also doubling as a local max and a global min doubling as a local min um, if your function is a type to where it, it looks like what you're seeing here. Okay. All right. So let me uh, go back here now. So um, we know all functions can have a global max, a global min and or a local max, a local min. That's possible. Um, the extreme value theorem here um, is an existential theorem, um, mainly just means uh, a theorem that states the existence of something based upon some properties that, that we see happening, okay? And so this theorem will identify the conditions in which uh, some function will have at least one global max as well as at least one global min, okay? So, uh, what the extreme value theorem is going to say is, hey, if your function displays these conditions, I can guarantee you that you have at least one global max and at least one global min value um, per the conditions that we give you. And so the extreme value theorem essentially says this. So it says if we have a function uh, that has at least one global max and at least one global min, then is going to have these two criteria. Number one, the function is going to be defined for every x value within some closed interval here. And number two, your function is going to be continuous on that closed interval. Okay. Now, um, by definition, if you're, if you have a function that is continuous on a closed interval, then it means that every value f, um, in between a and b are going to be defined. But the special thing here is that um, it will also have to be defined at the n values at x equals a and at x equals b as well. Okay, so if if we essentially say I have a function that is defined um, on a closed interval, then I know that the extreme value theorem guarantees that I have at least one global max value and at least one global min value. Okay, uh, simply put. Now. The graphs that you're going to be looking at next are going to be all the different situations that you could possibly come up with um, as far as what a function will look like that will satisfy this extreme value thing. Okay. And um, I'm, I'm not, of course, including every single possibility as far as um, any function, but no matter what your function looks like is going to fall into one of these uh, categories that I have here. Okay. So your first um, picture here, um, Roman numeral number one, figure Roman numeral number one here, we have a situation where you have a global max at x equals uh, negative two. So in other words, a global max here and a global min at x equals four, okay? So this is a situation where we have this closed interval here, 
and we do have a global max and a global min. Okay. Notice here. Oh, and let me mention here that the global max and global min are strictly inside of the closed interval. Okay. So figure two, uh, we have a situation where uh, we have a global max that's located at an X value within the open interval, but a global min that is actually at the um, one of the N values of our closed interval. Okay. So uh, we see here that our domain here ends at X equals five. And we see that's where our global min actually is. So uh, the point that I'm trying to make here is that for global max and global min, we can have um, a global max or a global min at the end value of a closed interval. We uh, or at the end value of a domain period. OK, um, especially if the if the domain is such that um, the value at the end value of that particular closed interval. Well, the in value of that particular I'm trying to explain it, but I'll just draw it. <laughs> so in other words, if I had, uh, let's say from here, let's see, this is 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Right. So I have this interval. OK, because of the fact that this is a closed interval, I can have a global max or a global min at the end of either one at the at these particular X values here. But if I had something that looked like this, if this was my domain, then I would not be able to have a, a global max or a global min at these n values here because my function would not actually be defined at x equals five or at x equals negative six. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to say. So again, for figure number one, we have a global max and global min that are strictly inside of that closed interval. For figure two, we have a global max that is strictly inside the uh, closed interval, global max that's on one of the endpoint values. Figure three is the same thing, but you just switch off um, where the global min is. So we see the global min is at the beginning of the closed interval, global max still on the inside. Okay. For figure four, um, we see that we have a global min at both endpoints or end values of the uh, domain. And we see we have a global max that's inside um, of the interval here. Okay. And so um, this particular case, as well as this case, um, we're going to see later is going to be uh, involved. And I'll talk more about this in another video. Um, it'll be involved in a theorem called uh, Rolle's theorem, but it's basically a, a very specific case of another theorem called the mean value theorem. And, and um, if you're interested in knowing about that topic, of course, I have another video on that topic. OK. But here, uh, the main thing that I'm trying to communicate now is that we can have global uh, minima that are same value here. We can have two locations for um, a particular global minima, and we can have a global max that's on the inside here. Okay, um, here we now have global maxima. We have a global maximum at two different locations, and then we have a global minimum that's on the inside of the interval. And then this last case is what we call the degenerate case, because all these points here our local max and local minima all at the same time, okay? And so uh, again, that's called the trivial or degenerate case. Now, again, the point I wanna get across here is that in all of these examples here, we had a function that was con continuous um, over a closed interval. And by definition of it being continuous over a closed interval, um, the function was defined at every X value on that interval. And because of that, we had at least one global max and at least one global min in all those situations. So that is what the extreme value theorem is trying to communicate. So now we have seen what the extreme value theorem uh, is as far as its possibilities. Now we want to see um, 
situations where the con some conditions are violated. Okay. So for figure number seven here, notice that this function, um, it is on a closed interval. So the function is defined on a closed interval here because every value from X equals zero here to X equals nine, um, every X value has a corresponding Y value that goes with it. However, right here in the middle at one, two, three, four, five, at X equals five, we have a discontinuity here, okay? And because of the fact that we have this, uh, this jump discontinuity here, I have a global max, but I can't say that that is a global min, okay? So here the extreme value theorem, um, the, the condition of the function being continuous on the closed interval is being violated. And because of that, notice that I do not have both a global max and a global min, okay? All right, so in figure number eight, um, what we're seeing here is that um, our function is continuous, but it's not continuous on a closed interval, okay? Um, it is not continuous on the closed interval here. Uh, to be specific here, the interval that we're looking at um, is going to be from zero to seven. And because this function is not um, continuous, on a closed interval, it is on an open, but not a closed. I can't call that a global min. And of course, this is shooting up to infinity here. So I can't say that I have a global max there either. Okay. Okay. So the next thing that we are going to talk about is uh, sort of a computational way for us to be able to locate um, our local max slash local min values. Um, whenever we don't necessarily have a graph of the function that we're dealing with. And so we want to recall here that um, our function f of x um, could have peaks and dips in this graph where uh, the function has horizontal tangent lines, okay? So in other words, um, we know that if we have something that looks like this in your function or something that looks like this, uh, we know at this particular point, this is um, it's going to be that particular point is going to have um, a line that goes through it that's going to be a tangent line that's going to be horizontal. Same thing here. For this point, uh, the line that goes to that point tangentially uh, will uh, be a horizontal tangent line, which means the slope of that particular line is zero. Okay. Now, um, however, we also know that for functions um, where we have a peak or a dip may exist in the graph, um, these points may not necessarily have horizontal tangent lines at those locations. So in other words, we can have something that looks like this, where of course this point is not going to be where we have a horizontal tangent line. Um, we can have something that looks like this, like a corner, and we know at that point it's not going to be uh, a horizontal tangent line there either. Okay. So we will see that the definitions of what um, we call a critical number or a critical value sometimes is called uh, summarizes the conditions for when a peak or a dip um, in our graph can occur. Okay, And so that's really the, the main purpose behind uh, this whole concept of a critical number is to be able to computationally figure out um, the, the places where we potentially have a peak or a dip in our graph. Um, we'll also talk about a complementary theorem called Fermat's theorem um, to help to, to discern when a critical number um, locates um, when some function has exactly a horizontal uh, tangent line in it. Okay, So in other words, uh, Fermat's theorem is going to give us the conditions for when we have specifically these types of situations. Um, in general, a critical value will let us know if we have any one of these four situations here, but Fermat's theorem is going to particularly talk about these two. All right, so let's look at those uh, definition for the definition of a critical value and Fermat's theorem. So for our definition of a critical number or a critical value, we see that a critical number of a function f is some number c that is in the domain of our function f such that either uh, when we take 
the derivative of our function and evaluate it at c, we end up getting zero, or we know that the derivative does not exist. Okay. Now, in the specific case when we take the derivative of our function, evaluate it at this value c, and we get zero as an outcome, what we're essentially having here is the smooth peak here or the smooth dip. Okay. When the derivative does not exist at that particular um, x value c, then we know that the function is not differentiable then. Okay. And that could mean that um, the function has a discontinuity, meaning it has a hole there, or it has a vertical asymptote there, or it may, um, it may actually be continuous there, but it may have a sharp corner or a cusp where our corner will look something like this, whereas our cusp will look like that. Okay. But at both of these places, we see that in, in this case, I have a local min. In this case, I have a local max. So for Ma's theorem, um, basically gives us the conditions here that force us to have this situation here, where we have a smooth peak or a smooth dip. And so here it says that if our function has a, a local max or min, meaning we have a peak or a dip in our graph um, at x equals c, and on top of that, we know that the derivative exists, okay? Um, that is to say the derivative of our function evaluated at c is a real number, and thus it is differentiable. Then we know that f prime of c is equal to zero, um, aka this means that our function has a horizontal tangent line at x equals c. So uh, essentially from our theorem just kind of drills down a bit more um, with the whole selection of of what will I'll put it like this. So with the critical number, we just know, hey, we got a peak or a dip in our graph, but we don't know if it's going to be a smooth peak or dip or a rough peak or dip. From our theorem just basically says that, hey, if you have a smooth peak or dip, um, not only are you going to have a peak or dip in your graph, but you're going to be able to show that um, your function here has a horizontal tangent line. Okay. And so that's essentially what Fermat's theorem is about. Now, notice that the critical value and Fermat's theorem, those two things are, are coming together to help us to be able to find out local maxima and local minima values. Okay. The closed interval method, along with the extreme value theorem here, this method and this theorem are working together to give you a process for finding a global max and global min values whenever you're looking at a function over a closed interval. Okay. So to put that another way, um, when we talk about critical values and Fermat's theorem, um, again, we are looking for local max, local min. We're using you know, that theorem and the definition of a critical value to be able to do that. For the closed interval method, or if we want to find out where our global max and global min values are, we're going to use a closed interval method, which is going to use this concept of a critical value as well. So you're going to see that kind of sneak into that. But uh, we also, um, in some special cases here, use the extreme value theorem. And remember that the extreme value theorem just said that if we have a function that is um, continuous over a closed interval, and by saying that that function is continuous over a closed interval, um, we imply that that particular function is defined for every value uh, within that interval, except for possibly the end values, then um, we know by saying that we can guarantee that we have um, at least one global max and at least one global min. Okay. Now we're going to go over um, the process for the closed interval method here, and it's uh, relatively simple. Um, all we do is for that function, we are going to find the critical values um, of F within this closed interval here. And uh, remember that the closed interval method can only be used whenever we are considering a function over a closed interval. 
hence the reason why it's called that. And um, again, the, the purpose for that is to make sure that uh, we can exploit this extreme value theorem here. OK, so uh, we want to find the values of F um, at critical values. Basically, we're trying to figure out where are our peaks and where are our dips in our graph. OK, we also want to look at the um, end values or endpoints of the um, closed interval for which we're considering the function by and evaluating our function at these end values here. OK, so. Step one, we're trying to figure out where do we have the potential to have peaks and dips in our graph in between A and B. Step two, we are trying to figure out what is the value of F of A and F of B. And then step three just says compare the values that we get here along with the values for these places where you have a, a peak or dip in your graph. And we're going to see what value is the highest? What value is the lowest? OK, um, the highest value, the highest Y value uh, will be your global max value. And the X value that corresponds to that will be the location of your global max. The smallest value will be your global min value. And the corresponding X value for that will be the location where the global min happens. All right, so now what we are about to do is go through several examples uh, to where we will be either using um, this concept of the critical number um, and or the closed interval method, depending upon the situation, uh, for us to be able to find out uh, whether we have local max or min and or global max or min. All right, so before we get into those examples here, I wanted to show you um, this is a an illustration that I got out of uh, one of the textbooks uh, that I've, I've taught out of before. And I wanted to show you how some textbooks um, actually allow uh, a local min or a local max to be at the end of a domain. Uh, but really, um, that shouldn't be so. So like here, you see how it says you have a local minimum. Um, really, that's not true uh, because it's evaluating. It, it is violating uh, the definition of increasing and decreasing, which kind of feeds into uh, the definition of local max and local min. So, um, you know, really this can't happen here. However, you can have an absolute minimum. OK, so uh, you can have an absolute minimum or absolute maximum at an endpoint in the domain, but you should not be having um, local max or local min there. OK. And so this is uh, another case here. Um, again, we should not be considering um, this being a local min here um, at the end point of this domain. Um, however, you see uh, we have the situation here where we have a smooth peak. Here we have a um, is this I call this a rough peak. Um, this is more like a, a corner. Uh, a smooth dip here. And notice here, uh, this portion of this function here is monotonic uh, because it's always, you know, trying to increase here. And this portion of this function is monotonic because it's always decreasing. OK, now, um, in general, a monotonic function, again, is always increasing or decreasing for all the values in its domain. So that's why I kind of worded it for just this piece of it, OK, because uh, in general, this um, function here is really not monotonic at all. Okay. But here you get a good example of seeing um, all the different types of places where you will have critical values. Okay. Now, the, the, the one thing I wanted to point out here, though, and the reason why I'm actually showing this particular picture is that notice that at these places where the derivative of the function is equal to zero, meaning uh, where you have these tangent lines here that are horizontal, but the function either increases or decreases. Uh, the, the method that we use to figure out critical values will still give us these particular situations as well. OK, and so that's why I said that critical values uh, basically let us know the places where we have the po potential of having a peak or dip in our graph. OK, it doesn't guarantee that we have one, 
it just gives us it says hey if you want to have a peak or a dip in your graph anywhere um it's possible to have it at these points but again it can't guarantee it um, we would we would need more information to be able to actually guarantee it okay all right so for our first example here um what we want to do is we want to sketch a graph of a function uh, that is going to be continuous on this closed interval here, but it's going to follow uh, both of these properties. So um, this example here is going to follow both of these properties. Uh, we want to sketch at least two different examples. And of course, I've done one right here. Okay. So we want the uh, sketch one to have the same properties as sketch two in that uh, we will have no local max or local min values. Um, and the critical values will exist at um, x equals negative 5 and x equals 1. So as you can see here at x equals negative 5, I have a horizontal tangent line there. And at x equals 1, I have a horizontal tangent line here. So by, by definition, um, that is one of the conditions to actually have a critical value. Okay. Now, um, notice that since my function here is pretty much always decreasing, um, I can't have a local max or local min because local max means I switch from increasing to decreasing. Local min means I switch from decreasing to increasing. Okay. So here, increasing to decreasing, local max, decreasing to increasing, local min. I don't have that here, so um, can't have it. So another way that we could draw an, another sketch of something that has the same property here, um, I'll just count one, two, three, four, five here, and I'll just do it at this point, and I'm going to do it at one here. I'm actually going to do it up here. And do it here. Yeah, this will be better. So. I can actually draw something very similar to this, just draw it another way. So here I can have this be flat here, have that be flat there, make that go up like this, come down like that, make it go like that. So that is um, one graph that I could possibly use uh, to be able to draw something that has same kind of properties as a sketch number two. Now, another graph that I could possibly use here and I'm just going to dot right here. I'm going to make another one right here. Um, I could kind of cheat here and actually do this. So I have it go down like this, and it's just flat all the way across here. Um, that would be um, another way of doing it because, again, um, at this particular location, at this location, everywhere in between, I can't say that I have a local max or local min at either of those locations. Um, as well, um, everywhere in between uh, negative five to positive one. Here, okay. Now there's other possibilities I, I could come up with, but uh, these are the two most simple. All right, so let's move on to another example. All right, so now um, what we want to do is do another graph. Uh, we want to sketch some more graphs here, uh, but now we have two different types of graphs that we want to draw. So we see in example A, we want to draw a graph of some function that has a local max at x equals 2 and the function is differentiable at x equals 2 and f of 2 is defined. Whereas for um, example B, um, what we want is uh, a local max at 2, but the function is not differentiable, but yet it's still defined. Okay. All right, so let's switch colors here. All right, so for this first one, um, the fact that we're going to have a local max uh, means that we're going to have a peak in the graph. So that means we have a choice in between a corner or a smooth peak. The fact that it's differentiable um, takes out the possibility of having a corner, and it also takes out the possibility of having a cusp. So I know I'm going to have a smooth peak up here and of course if i actually have a point there it's going to be defined so anywhere along when x is equal to two and i'll just put it here um, 
as long as I have a graph that has this peak right here, nothing else really matters. Okay. So for instance, a um, simple graph to draw is just to draw a parabola like this. Um, I could have drawn anything and made it go up like this or made it go up like that. Really doesn't, um, well, could have made it go down and then up like this. So um, I could have also done something like this. Something like this on this end and maybe something like that on that end. I could have done that. But the main thing is to make sure that you have a smooth peak at X equals two. That's the main thing here. For this next graph, the fact that my function is not going to be differentiable and, and what this means is not going to be differentiable at X equals two. Um, that should say that here. Then what I could do instead of doing a smooth peak, I could make either a cusp or a corner. And so this time I'm going to elect to do a cusp. So my graph could look something like this here. Do something like that there. Okay. And so we see that at f of 2, it is defined. But however, I can't take the derivative at a cusp. And um, this, by definition, is still a local max. All right, so let's get into some computational examples. All right, so what we want to do now is look at our functions um, that are given to us, and we want to figure out what are going to be the critical numbers uh, for those functions. Now, remember, when we say critical number, what we actually mean is that we are trying to find the places where we have potential peaks and dips in our graph, okay? Um, and based upon the, the function type that we're dealing with, um, we'll know whether we have a possibility of having the derivative of a function equaling zero um, and or if the derivative of the function um, will not exist, okay? Now, for this first function here, uh, we see that it is a polynomial, uh, in particular a polynomial of degree 4. Polynomials are continuous for all real numbers, so the fact that the derivative at some value c would not exist is not going to be a possibility. So for example a here, the only thing that we are looking for is when a derivative is equal to 0. Okay. So of course the first thing that we would need to do here is take the derivative of this function and using differentiation rules this would be 12 t squared plus 12 t minus 12 oh sorry 12 t nah i messed up those powers here this should be 12 t cubed um, plus 12 t squared minus 12 t okay and let me erase this right quick Going to write it like this because really this is what we're looking for here. Okay. All right. So at this stage, um, we know that we have in common in each term a positive 12t. So if I do that, uh, then I'll have t squared in the first term plus t in the second term minus 1 in the third term. And what we want here is to just have this equal to zero. So from this point, um, we know that this means that either 12t is equal to zero, or we have t squared plus t minus one is equal to zero. Now, of course, for this first one here, this just means that t is equal to zero if we divide both sides by 12. So that's relatively easy to do. For this second one here, uh, we could use the quadratic form. Okay, So if I do that, um, where my a in the quadratic form is going to be 1, my b is going to be 1, and my c is going to be minus 1, this is going to be minus 1 plus or minus 1 squared minus 4 a and then minus 1 here c and then all that is divided by 2 times 1 
And so now you have minus one plus or minus. And then of course, uh, this negative times this negative here is a positive. And four times one times one is just four plus one is going to be five. And so all that divided by two. And thus our critical numbers will be values of zero and minus one plus or minus square root of five divided by two. Okay. And so these are three different numbers here. Now, um, before we move on to the next example, I do want to kind of show you why it is that we find these uh, critical numbers here. And if we leverage what we know from pre-cal, uh, we could kind of get an idea of what this function is going to act like because of it. Okay, so um, I'm going to move over to another screen here so that uh, we can kind of see what's actually going on uh, with the graph of this function. Okay, so for our first uh, computational example here, uh, remember this was our function s of t. And remember that we had um, basically places where we could either have a local max or a local min at either um, this particular value here at uh, negative 1 minus uh, square root of 5 over 2, um, at minus 1 plus square root of 5 all over 2, and at 0. And I really didn't mean to put this here, so I'm going to erase that. Yeah, because it's not x intercept there. All right, but we have these three different places where um, we have either a local max or local min. So, using what we know from pre cal, we know that if this degree here is even and we know that if this number is positive we know that the end behavior of this particular graph is going to look something like this okay so knowing that and, and knowing um, here that this graph is going to be continuous for all real numbers i can surmise here that at this particular x value i'm going to have a local min here i'm going to have a local max and here I'm going to have another local min. And if I was to draw this graph here, you'll see that everything kind of works out. Okay. And so um, for this particular graph, because I know um, how many different places I would have a potential peak or dip, I could kind of make a guess on what that graph would look like. Okay. Now, um, of course, I'm not taking everything into account here because um, actually this point that's up here, if I was really looking at it, since if I plug in t equals zero, it would actually be down here. Um, I could actually move this graph down to where uh, this graph may possibly look something like this. You know, if I was to do it. So, um, and of course I could probably verify um, what the x-intercepts are here just by factoring out um, t squared and then figuring out what the what the other zeros would be left but that's not really the, the point of this problem the main thing i want to show you here is that by us knowing the particular values where we have potential peak or dip in the graph um, and knowing that it is a polynomial i can make a guess as to what that graph would look like and uh, kind of piece it together here so that's somewhat of what uh, the information with a critical value allows you to be able to see. All right, so let's go back to some more examples. Okay, so for this next example here, um, we notice that we have uh, an absolute value function here, and I've went ahead and defined what that absolute value function uh, looks like from a piecewise perspective. Um, but what I'm going to do is take a graphical approach just to conceptually have us understand what it is that we're doing here so that we can see that this is a relatively easy problem to answer. So if I was to draw what this graph would look like here, um, in general, just knowing what an absolute value function looks like and all the little transformations that goes along with it, 
Um, in short, I'm going to have a graph that looks like a V and it is going to be um, its vertex point here is going to be at the, the point four thirds zero. OK, now, of course, to the left of four thirds here is going to be a line with a negative slope. And that's why we have this part. To the right of four thirds, we have a line with a positive slope, and that's why we have this. And of course, at four thirds, value is going to be zero. Now, our goal is to figure out when is the derivative of this particular function going to be zero, okay? Or when is the derivative of this function is going to be a does not exist case, okay? Now, in this particular situation, since our function has a corner in it, this is not going to be possible, meaning we're not going to have a smooth peak or a smooth dip. As a matter of fact, since we already kind of know what the graph looks like, we know there's going to be a quote unquote rough dip in the graph. So we need to figure out when this particular function's derivative would not exist. Well, that's relatively simple. It's not going to exist exactly at the place where we have the corner. Okay. So here, our critical value here, just by knowing what we know um, about the graph of this function here, will end up being at t equal four thirds. Oops. Yeah. Nah. Let's try that again. Yeah, so t equals four thirds there. Okay. All right, moving on to the next example. Now uh, for this one, uh, this is um, a little bit sexier than the other two. <laughs> but here we see we have natural log of x divided by x squared, which we can also look at this way. Um, notice that I've chosen to take the derivative of this function by uh, using the quotient rule, meaning looking at it in this form, versus the product rule, looking at it in this form. Um, again, what I want to know is when is derivative of this function going to be equal to zero or when is it not going to exist? OK. Well, I know that since the domain of this function is going to be values of X that are positive, um, I know that the derivative won't exist um, when X is equal to zero uh, and it won't do that because my denominator here would be zero. I can't take anything and divide it by zero. I also know that natural log of zero um, is actually negative infinity, which that's not a real number either. So I know zero can't be in the domain. So I'm not going to be able to take the derivative there. Now, with that being said, other than at x equals um, zero or anything negative, I know my natural log function and my x squared function are both uh, continuous functions for all positive real numbers. OK, so this lets me know that um, excluding this x equals zero and x being negative, I'm not going to come up with this situation here. So I'm only looking for when my function, when the derivative of my function is equal to zero. So uh, once I do the quotient rule here, simplify what I can, um, I figure out that the derivative of this function is going to equal to zero whenever the numerator uh, whenever I find the x value for the numerator to be zero. Okay. So here I note that. And then of course I just solve this linear, that's well, not linear, but solve this logarithmic equation here. So I decide to divide both sides by two. And then I just use the definition of a logarithm to re, um, rewrite this logarithmic equation into an exponential. And of course, um, e raised to the one half here is the same as square root of e. So um, at square root of e on the graph of that function here, I'll know that I either have a peak or a dip. Um, or put it, putting it formally, I either have a local max or a local min in my graph. And again, I don't know uh, because I don't know what the graph of that function would look like if it would actually be a peak or a dip. Um, what I do know is that if it is a peak, it will be a smooth one. And if it is a dip, it is going to be a smooth one. Um, that's what I do know because this situation here, whenever I take the derivative of some function have it equal zero, means that wherever, which in this case is square root of e, 
wherever that's located, I'm going to have a horizontal tangent line there. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the next example. Okay, so for this example, we're actually going to exercise the closed interval method, okay? So remember that uh, when we find critical values, uh, we're strictly trying to find places where we have a potential of having a peak or a dip in our graph. Uh, formally put, places where we have a local max or local min in our graph. For the closed interval method, what we're doing is we're considering a function over a closed interval and we are trying to find out what is the highest y value, better known as the absolute max, or the lowest y value, which is called the absolute minimum. Now, if you remember, step one of the closed interval method was just to find uh, the critical numbers or critical values of our function. Okay, and so since this function here, uh, x cubed minus 6x squared plus 9x plus 2 is a polynomial. We know that um, we're going to have to find it for the situation of when the derivative of the function is equal to 0. Okay, So we're going to go ahead and do step 1 now. Take the derivative, set it equal to 0, and that's going to imply here that 3x squared minus 12x plus 9 is equal to 0. And um, I could factor out a common factor of 3 here. And from here, uh, of course, if I divided both sides by 3, then I would just get x squared minus 4x plus 3 is equal to 0. And this would be x minus 3 times x minus 1 is equal to 0. So my critical values here would just be x is equal to 1 and 3. Okay. Step 2 would be to find out um, at negative 1 and at 4 what is going to be my corresponding y value for the function. Okay. So here I'm going to find out what f of a is, which is f of minus 1. And if I go ahead, I'm just going to write all this stuff in. Okay, so this would be a minus 1. Um, negative 1 squared is a positive 1. And that minus 6 minus 9 plus 2. And if I do that, minus 1 minus 6 is minus 7. Uh, minus 7 minus 9 is a minus 16. Minus 16 plus 2 is a minus 14. And we'll do the same thing for f of b. And that is going to be 4. It's going to be minus 4 cubed, minus 6, minus 4 squared, plus, oh, that should be positive 4, not minus 4. Yep, okay. Have that. So it'll be uh, positive 4 cubed, minus 6 times positive 4 squared. Uh, plus 9 times positive 4 plus 2. And I'll go ahead and get rid of those positives there just to keep the confusion down. All right, so we know that 4 cubed is 64. Um, we have uh, 4 squared, which is 16. And then 16 times 6 is 96. So it'll be a minus 96 here. And then 9 times 4 is 36. And then we add 2 there. So if we do 64 minus 96, that will be a minus 32. Minus 32 plus 36 is a positive 4. And positive 4 plus 2 is going to be a positive 6. 
Now, um, in addition to this, uh, what we need to do is we would need to figure out um, also what is f of 1 and what is f of 3 as well. Okay. And so the reason for this is we need to know um, out of all these values, meaning the f of a, f of b, f of 1, f of 3, which one is the highest, which one is the lowest. Okay. So um, I'm not going to bore you with the details of writing this. I'm going to pause the video, write all this out, and then come back, and then we'll talk about comparing the values. All right, so now we see that f of 1 ends up being 6, and f of 3 ends up being 2. So if we're looking at high values and low values here, uh, we see that our low value here is minus 14. So this is going to be our global minimum value. And our high value here is actually 6. And that actually occurs at two places, which is at x equals 1 and x equals 4. And these will be our global max values. Okay. And so notice that since we are talking about a function that is by definition continuous because it's a polynomial um, over this closed interval here, we were guaranteed by the extreme value theorem to have at least one global max and at least one global min value. Okay. Um, and of course we have, well, let me rephrase that. So we're guaranteed to have at least one location where we have a global max and at least one location where we have a glo global min. And here we actually have one global min, but actually two global max locations. Okay. All right. So for our last example, um, still going to be another um, closed interval method type problem here. Uh, but this one, um, we have trig function uh, that we're dealing with. So it's a little bit more involved, but uh, same kind of thing. Uh, we have a trig function here, and that trig function, uh, we're looking at it within the closed interval from uh, pi over 4 to 7 pi over 4, okay? Now, notice that with the closed interval method, we have to know that our function is going to be continuous over um, a closed interval, okay? Now, by definition, we know that t is going to be continuous for all real numbers. So it means it'll also be continuous over this closed interval here. But we're not sure about um, cotangent of 1 half t, okay? And so I say that because we know that cotangent of 1 half t has some vertical asymptotes in it, okay? So we're gonna take a quick look at what that graph looks like to show you why we know um, this particular interval would actually work as far as using the closed interval method. Okay, so I've taken the time to draw um, what cotangent of t would look like uh, for three full periods. And so um, what you see me uh, marking here, and I'll go ahead and um, write this in. Right now, this is pi over four. Oh, wrong color. So let's erase that. This is pi over 4, and this is 7 pi over 4 here. So let me get this in the right color. Okay, so pi over 4 here, 7 pi over 4 here. Okay. Now, notice that from pi over 4 to 7 pi over 4, for cotangent of t, we have this vertical asymptote here at pi. And if we were trying to work this problem and we just had cotangent of t, we would not be able to use a closed interval method because cotangent of t is not continuous for all values um, in this closed interval from pi over 4 to 7 pi over 4. Okay. However, if we were to take this function here and now um, put a 1 half t inside of its argument versus just t, then what we are doing in this case is horizontally stretching this particular function. Okay. Now, uh, notice that if we had a cotangent of 2t, we would be horizontally compressing it. 
which means we'll be um, making it squish in or smush in. But since we have it um, cotangent of one half T, we are horizontally stretching it. Okay. So if we're horizontally stretching this particular um, function here, um, essentially what that would mean for us um, in terms of these values here is that we would have to uh, multiply uh, everything by two. Okay. So here that means this minus pi here would be minus two pi. Uh, of course, uh, this would still be zero. This would be two pi. This would be four pi. Okay. And um, also because of that, here uh, all this would change as well. So I'm going to get rid of that and we're actually going to put in where our new um, pi over four, new seven pi over four would be located at. So let's see here. So now since this vertical asymptote here is two pi, of course what I'm seeing here is pi. I'll go ahead and I'll write that in. So this is pi. So what that means now is that pi over four is sitting about right here. And seven pi over four is sitting at about right here. And of course, if we look from here down to here, my graph is continuous from pi over four to seven pi over four here. So that's how we know for this particular problem um, cotangent of one half t would be continuous for all uh, numbers in between pi over four and seven pi over four, and thus uh, we would be able to use this closed interval method. All right, so let's go back and um, close out this example by looking at the computation for it. All right, so now that we know why we can actually use this function f of t um, over this closed interval to be able to figure out where its global max and global min would be. Um, and since we know that the function is continuous over that closed interval, um, we know that we're guaranteed to find at least one global max and at least one global min uh, via the extreme value theorem. Uh, we're going to go search for that. So of course, the first thing that we do is take the derivative of both terms of this function. And you see that that's done here. Uh, we know the derivative of cotangent is cosecant squared. And since we have a one half T on the inside there, we have to use a chain rule. Uh, from that point, um, of course, T is uh, the derivative of T is one. So we have uh, this expression here. We're just going to set it equal to zero, solve for T. So uh, you see that I do that. Um, I end up doing some algebraic manipulation here to get um, cosecant squared of t over 2 um, equal to 2. Um, and then, of course, from there, um, I try to take the principal root of both sides. So I have uh, cosecant of 1 half t is equal to plus or minus square root of 2. Um, I realize that cosecant of 1 half t is just 1 over sine. Um, rewrite everything in terms of sine just to make trying to solve this particular equation a little bit easier. And then from this point, um, I'm electing to let t divided by 2 uh, just equal theta, just so that it's a little bit easier to um, solve. So here, um, I let all this look like sine of theta is equal to plus or minus 1 over square root of 2. And um, if you remember anything about um, you know right angle trigonometry here, um, anytime we have um, 1 divided by square root of 2 and we're talking about sine, of course, uh, the corresponding angle here is going to be 45 degrees, which in terms of radians is just going to be pi over 4. Um, but of course, we need to consider the fact that sine is positive in both the first quadrant and the second quadrant. So um, what we would actually have here is pi over 4 and then pi minus pi over 4. So that's where we get the 3 pi over 4 from. 
Um, similarly, uh, sine is negative in quadrants three and four. So we would have to have those corresponding angles in quadrant three, uh, which is going to be five pi over four and in quadrant four, which is seven pi over four. And so from that, um, this would be our answers in terms of critical values in terms of theta, but we want it in terms of t. So we now realize that, hey, theta was just t divided by two. So we got to multiply um, both sides of each of these equations here um, by two in order to get t. So that's what you see me doing here. And we see that in, in both instances um, when we do that. And of course, uh, this five pi over two and seven pi over two is really just one full rotation plus a little extra. Once we account for that, we see that we're essentially talking about the same two angles. So our critical values here are just pi over two and three pi over two, okay? Now, for the closed interval method, uh, remember that we need to evaluate the function at our critical values, evaluate the function at the end values of our, our interval here. So we're gonna evaluate it at pi over four, and seven pi over four, okay? Um, as you can see here, I've done that, evaluated at the two critical values here, evaluated at pi over four, evaluated at seven pi over four, and I get these answers here, a 2.57, 3.71, um, um, roughly about uh, 3.2 and 3.084, okay? Um, and again, I give the exact value, and then afterwards I give the decimal approximation. Um, here we see, uh, from, from what we're looking at here, the lowest value is going to be this 2.57. The highest value is going to be this 3.71. So this means that um, we're going to have a global minimum here at the location of pi over 2 we're going to have a global maximum here at the location of three pi over two. So of course, um, I note that here, just did all my summary of answers here, realized this was the smallest, um, and I know I don't know why that says 6.71, that should be 3.71. Um, that's going to be the largest number, so our global min value is this, and it's located at pi over two. Our global max value is this, approximated to that, and is located at this particular x value. All right, and so with that, that concludes our video on um, studying local extrema, as well as um, absolute max, absolute min, um, talking about critical numbers, um, what that actually means, the extreme value theorem, and the uh, closed interval method, which is the method that we use to find global max and global min values whenever we're looking at continuous functions over closed intervals. Take care.